I'm adding adventures uh, to the title here a little bit. I'll, sh I'll explain to you why. Here's what I'm going to do. <clears throat> I'm going to um, tell you the main argument of the book, especially as related to visual material. I'm going to do that in part by telling you how the book came about, what was involved in locating sources, and I'm going to sketch a bit of the technology changes since I started back in 2000. Mm -hmm. But first, I want to thank the many people in Hawaii, especially at UH, who have helped me along the way. The Center for Biographical Research let me give uh, a couple of talks about this earlier and receive feedback. Um, one of the people then was George Simpson, whom I uh, greatly appreciated for attending. He was always um, uh, giving me good questions to think about and other ideas, even after the conversations. I thank my colleagues at Women's Studies, especially Mita um, Chesney Lind and Kathy Ferguson. Nancy Cooper helped me with a whole mess of editorial fine points. Kathy Phillips and Deborah Ross gave me innumerable precious suggestions along the way. Corey Moore, Marie Jose Paciotto, and uh, Jean Toyama helped me avoid um, some language misunderstandings that I otherwise would have stepped into. So I think, and, and there are many others whom I would like to thank too, including Pat for the uh, encouragement from time to time too. Um, now I'm realizing that one of the one of the struggles I had in setting this, this up was trying to figure out um, what you what different people were going to see because some people at home will be seeing a close up of these images and the rest of you will not. So that's just a bit, I, I, but I'll tell you what's on the screen in case this is a bit hard to read. Um, so a little background about Catherine so that you know who, who she is. She was born in 1729, um, a, an insignificant, I need to stress that, German princess named Sophie Frederica Augusta. Uh, her principality was called Anhalt Serbst Dornburg. There's a good reason you probably have never heard of it. It's <laughs> minuscule and unimportant. Um, in 1745, she married the crown prince of Russia, the grandson of Peter the Great. In 1754, quite a long time afterwards, they had their first child, a boy named Paul. In 1762, January 5th, her husband finally became the czar. The previous ruler died. And six months later, almost to the day, Catherine overthrew him and seized the throne. She reigned from 1762 until 1796. <clears throat> so that's who Catherine was. Let me see. Oh, I think maybe. Um, and my the main argument I'm making in my book is that she was the first modern international woman celebrity. Uh, that's what I want to claim and what I hope to persuade you of today. Initially, I was interested in Catherine's reception in Germany. In other words, um, not, not in Russia, but I was focusing on Germany. Um, I was looking at her reception outside of royalty and the upper aristocracy. And that means I was looking at the emerging middle class and uh, levels of society below that. I don't know Russian, and I knew I wouldn't have a chance to figure out her reception there. Um, so I decided to focus on Germany at first, and later I expanded it to look internationally. Today, I'm going to tell you about four of the cities where I worked on the project, Berlin, Weimar, St. Petersburg, and London. And these are the questions that I was trying to address. What is celebrity? What is international celebrity? Did it and could it exist in the 18th century? And how can we tell? Um, <clears throat> so um, in 2000, in the year 2000, when I started, very little um, about celebrity in the 18th century had been written and almost no methodological or theoretical scholarship had been done for that time period. So this definition here is not tailored to the 18th century. It's a general one, which I've drawn on the work of um, a number of excellent scholars, David Marshall, Chris Rojak, Stella Tilliard, and more recently, Anton Lilti, uh, to, to come up with. So I, I assert that celebrity is a discourse 
that arises when an audience establishes an, an intense and unpragmatic parasocial, that means one, uh, one way, relation to a famous contemporary based on representation in words and images of that person that are widely commodified. And I have this picture here as a strong assertion mm -hmm. about the importance of images. Um, I'm gonna focus on images today, partly because that works so well in this particular setting of Zoom, but also because um, they are so crucial for celebrity and they speak to readers or viewers differently than, than texts that do, and they circumvent literacy issues to a degree. So trying to operationalize that uh, definition into some um, um, techniques for actually addressing the materials that were going to be available to me, I started thinking of celebrity as a threesome, which of course I called a troika, uh, given the source here, <clears throat> a troika of agents. The first one is the celebrated individual. You can see the picture uh, there in the middle. That's the celebrated individual. The second one is the audience. The third one is the uh, media worker. That means both the producers and the distributors of media. And then the fourth point here is that it is commodified. Celebrity is a commodified discourse uh, without uh, money, uh, celebrity doesn't exist. And what are the buyers purchasing? They're buying a fantasy. So does the Troika pattern fit with Catherine? Um, she would be agent one, the celebrated individual. Catherine was highly motivated to be seen as the news arena and very fortunate for this, for the um, evolution of, of celebrity was this intersection, as I see it, between the discourse that rulers particularly focused on, which was their glory, their gloire, and the interest of the general public, which we think of now as celebrity. So the elite discourse and the non-elite discourse can be seen as uh, intersecting in a way that made celebrity both possible and even to Catherine, somewhat desirable. Otherwise, frankly, she didn't care a bit about what people of our level would have thought. But because of the implications for Dwar, she was interested. Uh, her Dwar would be, was expressed with, for example, very grand portraits, such as that one of her on the horse and this one of the coronation. Uh, the horse one is, by the way, from, the, from conducting the coup against her husband. And this one later on in, in a very glamorous gown. So grand portraits like this were manufactured to enhance her gloire. And then they were copied. Copies were sent to courts all over Europe. And then those courts that were so fortunate to have them allowed painters from other lesser courts to come in and make copies so that these portraits were spread around among the highest levels of society. But interesting also is that Catherine, trying to defend herself after overthrowing her husband, uh, the son, grandson of Peter the Great, wrote manifestos telling her story of the coup. And with that, she immediately got international attention and a, a, a fantastic story was underway. So, so she had a story, she was available, but was she famous? Well, I've already kind of uh, told you my answer to that, but I got real fascinating documentation of it rather early in my work. When I um, became acquainted with the person I call my uh, Russian, my first Russian best friend, uh, this is Vasily Alexievich Bilbasov. And I discovered in preparing for this talk that he was actually Ukrainian. Uh, but at the time, I have to admit, there was not a significant, there was not a national boundary difference between the Ukraine and Russia. Um, he wrote a book in which he tried to enumerate every single publication about Catherine that had appeared outside of Russia. That's what he means by world literature. Um, during her lifetime in volume one and after her death until until whatever his cutoff point was in volume two. He found 774 items 
uh, published outside Russia. This is, we're talking about books and pamphlets um, during her lifetime and another 125 by 1810. That was the cutoff point of my work. So altogether 899 items. Um, and oh, he had run into some political problems in, uh, in Russia. And so he had moved to Berlin and published his book in German, which was of course, perfect for me. Um, so that was Catherine. Was she available as a uh, celebrity individual in celebrity discourse? Question two is, was there an audience? Was there an 18th century audience for Catherine as a celebrity? Well, in theory, social history would say yes. There was a growing middle class in many European countries. Literacy was improving. There was, uh, the middle class was beginning to have more leisure time, time to spend reading stuff that was unpragmatic, as I said before. In practice, um, it's very hard to know. There's minimal direct evidence. My evidence about the fan base is overwhelmingly indirect. Looking at what seems to be the intended audience of the various materials which I located. And agent three, media workers, could and did the media provide celebrity fodder about Catherine? Were the media widespread? Were they abundant? Did they tell stories? Celebrity love story. Did they promote identification? Celebrity relies on identification of readers with view, um, the celebrity with the celebrity, did they support continued interest? Well, I think that I think that the materials which I have found, you know, initially thanks entirely to Mr. Bildestock, um, I think that the answer to the, the, all of those questions is yes. And what about the visual material? What about the visual, what I call celebrity fodder? Um, well, that is material that has to elicit fantasy and identification. It proposes visions of upward social mo mobility that's classic for celebrity discourse, including today. Why else do we care so much about the queen? Invites feeling of knowledgeability about whoever the real person was, the real Catherine, the real George Clooney, the real um, Diana. Uh, that, those are the things that visual items try to provide to, to the viewers and as part of celebrity discourse. Um, so the challenge to me was that I've never worked seriously with visual material. And so I started with books, uh, not with pictures. And the books that I, I was very fortunate, I was ready for a sabbatical in uh, spring of 2000 in Berlin. And um, I don't know if you can, remember or if you've heard about what uh, research conditions were like at that time, but there was very little computer computerization going on, digitization. So the library, this is this wonderful state library in Berlin, um, had a great card catalog and it was cards. They were starting to digitize, but you couldn't count on the digital catalog. You had to make sure you looked things up uh, there. So I was able here to begin going through uh, Bilbasov's list. And, um, and that was tremendously important and valuable to me. There was another wrinkle, which is that in Berlin, er everything exists twice, once for East Berlin and once for West Berlin. And even in 2000, there's still that ex system still existed. So, um, so sometimes I needed to go over to the old library, which was being renovated and now at long last is in great condition. But all that time I had this nagging awareness that I needed to look for images. And um, visual images, as I said, they speak to the reader differently, they circumvent literacy, they can awaken feelings and they can tell stories. Uh, but I just didn't know how to do it and I was very reluctant. Finally, I took what you can see here was a three minute walk across the street to the, um, to the Prince collection of the State Museums of Berlin. And um, I walked in the door. Um, first, I had to check everything I owned in the library in the um, locker that they had there. I was only allowed to take in a pencil, a paper, uh, some pieces of paper, and my passport. Um, I went in, 
more or less tiptoed over to the desk where things were obviously being uh, administered and whispered. It was very clear that whispering was the way to go. I would like to see pictures of Catherine's great. Mm -hmm. And they whispered back to me, we don't organize our collection by topic. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I know how stricken I must have looked. And I apparently bumbled around saying, are you sure <laughs> that's the way you do it? Can't you find something for me? I must have babbled on for a bit. And so eventually they said, Maybe we can find something for you. So I, you know, signed in, turned over my passport and so on and, and went to sit down. And I sat down and I was very surprised when they brought me a picture and they brought it to me twice, the same picture in two copies. And I thought, oh, what's this about? Well, that was just how I was beginning to get acquainted with the way specialists in prints look at pictures. Every single state, this is a state, uh, is different, of course, because they're all handmade. And there may be corrections made between one and another and whatever. Anyway, you, you, if you're serious, you have as many states as you can. Um, so I sat there. Um, I think I must have gone in the afternoon, and I'm pretty sure I stayed until they closed. And I tried to figure out what I was looking at. That was really my question. I, I I had two copies of the same picture. They were somehow mounted a little bit because if I was going to touch a, a raw picture like one that I brought for you to look at, I had to put on white gloves, cotton gloves. Uh, but for this, I could just sit there with my pencil and look at the pictures and try to figure out what I was seeing. And I noticed that it had an oval frame and kind of pseudo stonework with a shadow being cast on it. And it had a caption and there was some minute, uh, let's see, is there an arrow here? No. Well, anyway, right at the bottom of the image, there was some minute handwriting or some minute writing. And I could see that the woman in the picture had a slight tilt to her head and she was wearing a, um, a kind of a Miss America sash across her chest. And she had this star thing attached to her dress. That was the kind of thing that I was able to write down and, and try to think about. The library was getting ready to close. And I said, or the uh, prince room was getting ready to close. And I said, I would be back the next day. I needed to look at these pictures some more. <laughs> Although I didn't know what I was going to do. But so I came back the next day. This time I borrowed a. Um, uh, a ruler and took measurements of the picture and measured this, that, and the other thing. And I just tried to keep myself busy. And after I had so, kind of demonstrated to them that I was actually serious, they said, maybe we have some more prints we can show you. And they started dribbling out a few more things. <laughs> like every day they would dribble out maybe two. Uh, <laughs> and I went, I, I'm quite sure it was five days in a row. And on the fifth day, they said, we have a Russian specialist at the print collection. Would you like to meet her? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, yes. <laughs> and um, um, so they said, she'll be in next, uh, on Monday. And uh, they, they warned me, they said, she looks kind of funny, but don't worry, she's okay. Mm -hmm. And um, of course I had no idea what that meant. And finally, when, when I got to meet her, she was a wonderful woman, uh, Mother Yelena Funk. She's the mother superior in a Russian Orthodox convent in uh, Berlin. And so of course she was dressed in a kind of a nun's outfit. But she was a very big help to me. And one of the first things she said to me, I think we got to go into her office so we could talk out loud. She asked me if I was using Robinsky. And I said, I don't know who that is. And she then introduced me to my second best friend. Uh, wait, now I've got to. There we go. Um, Dmitry Alexandrovich Robinsky, a real honest, uh, full on Russian. He, um, 
was very interested in, in prints. He created an amazing set of volumes about prints made in Russia, including identified in 526 different printed images made of Catherine during her lifetime. And um, in short, that became my to find list. Here's a page from Rovinsky. Um, he, among other great things, he had some pictures scattered through the Russian language text. That was a bit of an inconvenience for me. Let me see, I, I keep needing to. Now this is showing you kind of the outcome of working with Rovinsky. He had devised an excellent uh, system for keeping track of the pictures. And he gave me the, all the categories that I used, including his, I just use his numbering system. He divided the pictures into full face profile scenes and satires, and he numbered them chronologically. Um, and so you can't see this here, but uh, they are numbered R14, R15, R16, and so on. Um, just copying his number so I can always go back to the reference of what he um, had to say. <clears throat> and let me see, what else was I gonna say? Oh yeah, An another great thing about him, really this is a completely wonderful thing was that he wanted to be inclusive. He wanted to include every single picture, which is to say he didn't care about the quality of the picture. The Berlin print um, collection cares about quality. They want 15 states of the best pictures. They don't want one state of a crummy picture, but I wanted crummy pictures because those are the ones that that middle class and non-elite audience was going to be interested in. So I was very grateful that he included everything from the best to the worst. The worst are now the rarest, the hardest to find. Um, and the other thing that he did, which is absolutely magical, is he reproduced the text of every single print that he listed. So um, on the far right here, you can see that he, he's listing a text, a, a, uh, a picture which had text in Russia, in um, German and in French. And I eventually found this picture um, and the um, French is here. I mean, the German is here and the French is down here. It's exactly the way he described it. Every single word is there. This one doesn't have a, um, it doesn't have a an artist listed, the an, an engraver listed. But if there was, many of them did have engravers. That meant that I now had names of engravers to request, um, and this this was transformative for me. Um, in the fall of two thousand, I had a, a fellowship to go to another wonderful eighteen uh, source of eighteenth century materials, and that's Weimar which is basically an 18th century town in the south of Germany. And I also gave a talk there, um, which was a, my first chance in a, in a real 18th century setting to talk about what I was trying to do. Some of my audience was rather skeptical of, of my plans, but they were tolerant at least. And one of the things that I found when I was working there was how interesting newspapers could be as a source. Um, the problem with newspapers is that overwhelmingly when you use the 18th century ones, um, at least at that point in 2000, you had to use them on microfilm. If any of you have done that, it is grueling and horrible and makes you seasick and anyway, uh, but that was the way it was. Um, and then um, in the spring of the next year in 2001, in March, uh, we went, Steve and I went to St. Petersburg. And I had the very great honor of meeting one of the art curators there who had worked on Catherine's images uh, as they were disseminated outside of Russia, mostly paintings. That's Elisaveta Rene. Rene um, very helpful to me. We had a wonderful, useful discussion in which I learned a lot about how pictures got, paintings got modified from one copy to the next, sometimes made more glamorous and sometimes made more portable. Um, that's me standing outside the staff entrance to the Hermitage, which was great fun to be able to go through. Um, and then we spent some time at the Russian National Library. 
I, Steve and I had letters of introduction from a Russian scholar whom I had met at an international conference when I gave a paper on Catherine's plays. And um, we got a wonderful welcome there, including the assistance offered to us of an English speaking member of staff who um, showed us around and took care of us all day. Otherwise we would have been completely at a loss. The Russian National Library at that point was pretty much probably unchanged from when Bilbasov had worked there. Um, so, so having some guidance was, was absolutely critical. Um, there was one place where we were not welcomed. That was in the rare book room that focused on the Euro non-Russian European kind of materials. The librarian there was not happy to see me. Um, and she did not want to um, listen to me in English. She decided she would respond somewhat grudgingly to German, which was fine, but took me rather by surprise. I thought English might be more neutral than German, but it wasn't. Um, IBM actually very soon moved in and helped, uh, assisted the Russian National Library in digitizing their materials, and they're still very much involved. At the time I was working, I had a little portable Toshiba, and of course the batteries ran out after four hours. So from the Russian National Library, I have little spiral notebooks of our notes, some of which Steve took in languages that he didn't read. Uh, so, yeah. One of the things that I found there in the last minutes of being at the library before it closed was this marvelous print um, of, of the coup. Uh, it's in, the text is in German, the top row is about Catherine. This, the bottom row is about Peter and what happened to him. It ends with Peter in the coffin at the uh, in the last um, row of the picture. This is a unicum. That is to say, this is the only copy of it that I've found in all these years of looking around. And it's the only one at all like it that I have found. So I'm very, very glad that I found it there. Um, of course, I was not allowed to take a photograph. Cameras were not welcome in any of the libraries or archives or collections at that time. Uh, there were no, we had no cameras on our phones. I don't know when that started, but it wasn't available to us at that time. So I tried to sketch what I was seeing here, but you know, super quick, it was not, not effective. Um, but this is a little excerpt from it. So this is my translation of the little verse there, sight of the empress so moved the guards crowd that they with joy their loyal oath avowed. And you can see in the far end down here, tucked in is 9th of July. So this script here is extremely elaborate and actually relatively hard to read. The script would have been written by a different engraver than the picture. So there were picture engravers and usually separate uh, script engravers. And sometimes they had trouble getting, making room for all of the information they wanted to put in. Uh-oh, what have I done? Oh, I keep moving around. Oh, get rid of that. Maybe just, okay. <laughs> I have to stop moving this thing here. Okay, well, as I as I was working on these things, I gradually realized that I was silly to try to limit myself to the things that were happening in, in uh, Germany because uh, a lot of the things I was reading in German were actually translations from Italian and French and, and English. So I realized I, I better go ahead and think internationally. Um, and that's when Steve and I had a chance to be in London. I was the resident director for the UH Study Abroad program there. And that gave me lots of time to hang out in the uh, British Museum and the British Library. And in the middle of the British Library is this marvelous glass encased set of bookcases, gorgeous bookcases. Uh, and that contains George III's library. George was a big reader and he read in several different languages. I think he read French, German, and Italian. I know he read German a lot. That's okay. Oh, we. Um, um, and when he, when he died and when his son finally took over, uh, they had all of these books, um, and the, his son, who was a famous aesthete and liked to be in charge of his own, you're being uh, very kind. Home, the biggest jerks in history. <laughs> <laughs> he, uh, 
he said, um, the, these books don't fit in my decorating scheme for my enlarged palace, which is now became Buckingham Palace. That's what he made. So he sent them off. Oh, I'm going to go backwards if I can. Yeah, no, use the arrow on the keyboard. Are you seeing an arrow? On the keyboard. Oh, on the keyboard, right. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, because, okay, so all of those are his books. And they were then donated to the British Museum, which gave them to the library when the museum and the library separated. Um, I just wanted to mention that the library is also a good place to run into people. And that included Joy Ueno. Um, we had tea one time sitting next to George's books. I was loved when I asked, requested a book and it came from the King's Library. Um, but also fabulous in London is the um, many collect many prints from the British Museum. The museum kept prints for themselves, sent books to the British Library. Um, I got to go and look at their uh, Catherine prints that they that their second rate ones, which they leave in the annex out in um, no, I've forgotten the name of the of the district right now. But Boston I got to go to their Spa. annex. Boston Spa. No, not that one. This one is I think I've got it in my notes here somewhere. Um, Hammersmith. Oh, Hammersmith. in Hammersmith. Uh, okay, so. Anyway, that's kind of the gist of it. A quick aside, back to the business about newspapers. The London is a great place to see newspapers. There were so many newspapers at the time, but newspapers did not have pictures in them. They had mastheads, which would have been um, woodblock, woodcuts, but they had no pictures. So for me, looking at pictures, I needed to go elsewhere. So now I'm going to show you um, a series of pictures. This is really what I'm going to do next, and this is the um, going through that set of categories that Robinski talked about. So first of all, we have frontal head and shoulder pictures. Um, the frontal ones, obviously, with you're looking into gazing into somebody's face, and that gives you a feeling of intimacy. You're kind of close to them. You're only you're seeing head and shoulders as I'm seeing you right now. Um, so that feeling of intimacy is very good for, for celebrity. You have a sense of a personal encounter. Um, it was especially valuable at the time because in the 18th century, they were beginning to very, be very interested in individualism and in faces. And so this is a, a very powerful tool for celebrity discourse. And there are many, many copies of or variations of it. Some of them good quality, some of them very poor quality, but all of them kind of providing the same kind of thing. Then there are profiles. Profiles have a different kind of effect. They are reminiscent often of coins. Even at that time, they were reminiscent of coins. They suggest an exalted leader. Um, they also, but they were not completely uh, distanced and alien because silhouettes had come into fashion and had been kind of quasi invented in the 18th century. And so this was part of that kind of a notion. You could even make your own profiles of your friends at home. Um, so here are two. The, this one on the left is a very good quality uh, Spanish um, engraving of Catherine. She's wearing her hair in braids wrapped around her head. And that was also interesting. Uh, people noted that. Some people writing about these pictures noted in the 18th century, that this was a nice, simple hairdo. In other words, a, a viewer looking at this would say, gosh, I could do my hair like that too. Mm -hmm. um, and on the other hand, she's wearing this fur trimmed dress, which is very mm -hmm. uh, uh, fancy. And she's uh, got a very fancy garment on. But that became, this became an iconic image of Catherine. It reappears in many places. Over on the right is a slight variation of it. Doesn't have the, um, it doesn't have the braids. This is a little tiny picture about the size of a playing card. Um, it's got a, a German uh, caption and it was definitely meant to be a thrilling picture for some middle class or even slightly poorer perhaps uh, German buyer. And again, there are many, many variations of these profile pictures of Catherine. So 
uh, frontal pictures, profile pictures, and then full length scenes, mm -hmm. scenes in which Catherine is shown full length. These, this particular one is um, a little bit larger, maybe five by eight, um, but still not, not big. Um, and it uh, would have been relatively affordable because of its size. It focused on Catherine, and I just am pointing out that it's, her name is spelled down here with an A. There are many variations on her name, which you always have to take into account if you're Googling her. Um, and it is a fashion print, actually, you can tell. She's wearing a very special kind of gown, which people would have looked at with great interest. She's, it's also, I would say, intriguingly transgressive because she's in a military camp um, and she's got on a military hat and she's holding, she's got a sword at her side and she's holding a baton. Um, so that all suggests a story. And this picture was invented. This was invented to meet a demand. And that's a whole category of these full length pictures, inventions. Uh, they helped. They were cheaper to make. You didn't try to struggle to recreate some, some painting. Um, they helped you diversify the audience. They showed there was a diversified audience. And um, this one here, the one on the left, is a woodcut showing her with the um, Sultan of the Ottoman Empire. And the one on the right is an, a, an engraving. Um, I've brought it for those of you who are here today. It, and you can see it's very clumsy. Her arm is way too, her arms are way too long. Her feet are in a funny position. If her feet were actually there, she'd be falling over. Mm -hmm. She's got this giant sized um, scepter. It's, it's a crude picture. Uh, her head is very small. It's very wonderful to me. It's absolutely precious. And all of this stuff was invented. Oh, and here's my uh, my other favorite one. I haven't actually held this one in my hands. I found it online. Uh, that's Catherine. As you, you can't see it because it's the way this is shown right here, but um, it's labeled at the top. She looks rather furry, uh, but it's a woodblock and therefore it could be integrated with text. And this is from a, a magazine for Swiss peasants. So again, an indication of her widespread reputation. Here's another way of producing an affordable print. Take one that was originally of somebody else and change the <laughs> label. So sure enough, this one was Josepha and, uh, and then it got changed in the next one to uh, Catherine. Uh, <laughs> and this by the way is from Queen Elizabeth's uh, collection, the Royal Collections Trust. Um, and I can't remember, I don't think they had noticed this until I um, drew their attention to it. Um, so they changed the crown uh, that's at her, kind of at her, her waist there, and they changed the label, but otherwise, Josepha had died. You're a print seller. You have a perfectly good print of a lady here. Let's sell it, <laughs> sell it. So off they went. Now we're gonna look at satires. Um, and political satires are interesting both to fans and anti-fans. I haven't mentioned anti-fans, but celebrity elicits both fans and anti-fans. And we know from looking at cartoons that we see today that we, we appreciate them even when we are detesting the person who's depicted. So these, there are many, many uh, very interesting uh, political ca cartoons of Catherine. And they often use sex or uh, scatology to um, convey their message. That's George III squatting over there on the far side. And there's a little poem underneath. I can read it to you later if we have time. Now, this is another one. This is actually my latest find. I just found this about three weeks ago. By Googling a title from Rovinsky, you have to Google, if you haven't found it, you have to Google it over and over again because this week's maybe something's been digitized that wasn't available before. Um, this one looks like a, um, a, a non satirical scene at first glance. The way that you know rather soon that is probably satirical is the title underneath, which says circumcision of Stanislaus. And then when you look more closely, you realize that that's Catherine in her fur trimmed dress 
holding on to that man's shirt, which she seems to be taking off of him. That is the king of Poland. Oh. And she is pointing with both hands at a highlighted part of his garment. <laughs> uh, and there are two men in the cave uh, behind her, beside her. Those are the kings of Austria and Prussia. And on the ground in front is justice with the scales and the sword, but justice is asleep. Mm. Poor Stanislaus is pointing at justice, but justice sleeps on. Um, okay, and this is my last one now. Um, I've, that was, that previous one I showed you was would have been rather expensive because it was very carefully engraved. This one would, would have been even more expensive. It's large, it's very nicely painted. It's got a very ingenious design. Um, it shows the um, refugees uh, or the, um, I'm not remembering the term right now, but the, the French court, members of the French court who were, who were fleeing France during the French Revolution and hoping to get asylum with Catherine and assistance from Catherine. And so that's Catherine on the right there. And I really liked this picture, so I put it on my cover. <laughs> um, so could and did celebrity exist in the 18th century? Was there an 18th century audience for celebrity and was Catherine such a one? Well, the number and diverse quality of the prints tells me yes. Thank you. Yeah.